So, Secretary, you can note that you went over by eight minutes. Um, Don Lowe is going to give our next talk uh, concerning uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma as well as uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. Uh, I'd like to thank the association for this opportunity. I don't know, quite know why they thought I needed a full 15 minutes to cover this nice focused topic, but uh, I'll do my very best. Uh, they've asked me to talk about what we are doing. I'm, I'm also going to talk about what we should, doing, should be doing. And even though there are about uh, 20 different focuses I could take with respect to this particular topic, I'm going to concentrate on five. Each one of these could be a part of an hour presentation, but today it's going to be three to four minutes. Screening for gastric and esophageal cancer, much of the work that I need to present today has already been done by previous presentations. Our work at Virginia Mason in Seattle has previously compared esophageal resection to T1A and highly selected T1B, and clearly if you can find these people early, we have now endoscopic modalities in which we can treat them effectively and obviously the surrogate of that is we also improve survivorship. If you look at the aspects of what comes out of Sweden, 13% of people with chronic reflux lately have uh, Barrett's and as has been said multiple times during this conference, we are only finding a microcosm of these particular patients. We know from standard society reviews that the high risk population has been identified but we really can't come to any type of agreement about who we're going to screen. This, you've already seen this slide. I think this is a very important aspect of where we should be going. We can identify the high-risk population, but we have to get away from the aspect that everyone has to have white light endoscopy, and we have to identify better modalities that increase the aspect of accuracy and patient acceptance, and at the same time, limit costs within our screening program. You've already heard about this particular uh, cytosponge, which originated in uh, Cambridge and has undergone a, a significant degree of critical review. I will share with you that uh, five years ago in Cambridge, I was there when a bunch of other people, I swallowed this tablet and then pulled it up through my esophagus. Uh, it doesn't hurt, but boy, it feels profoundly weird, and I think I do have a hiatal hernia because uh, I think the cytosponge tried to pull it up into my mouth. <clears throat> what do you do when you find positive cytology in a cytosponge? You initiate the process to ensure that we identify the level of risk Barrett's esophageal cancer and you treat it appropriately. I have to remind myself repeatedly when I talk about esophageal and gastric cancer that even though we talk a lot about esophageal cancer, the incidence of gastric cancer, at least in 2015, is higher than esophageal cancer in the United States. We also know that we have excellent models in Japan and Korea where screening programs for gastric cancer have been initiated and they have specific approaches to H. pylori positivity in the young population and the majority of their adult population in Japan and Korea get screened. How is that translated? Well, even stage two disease has a 70% cure rate in Japan. And when you compare the aspect of service delivery, Japan and Korea versus the United States, we operate for early cancer in 20% of the time, and they operate for early cancer in over 50% of the time. So screening programs work when you can match them. And when we've looked for the criteria for gastric cancer screening in the US, we're starting to develop it, but clearly we have to match the resources and the risk groups to get a situation that's going to work long term. Process and centralization. I can't tell you how many surgical meetings I have gone to in which at some point during a surgical presentation for the treatment of esophageal cancer, someone has said surgery is the gold standard treatment for regional esophageal cancer. Um, that may have been true. I don't think it's true anymore. Surgery is an intricately important point, but there are certain things that we have to acknowledge. And there are surgeons in the audience that, like me, have lived through this. This is a publication from 15 years ago demonstrating that in high and low volume centers, we had unacceptable mortality rates with respect to the surgical treatment for esophageal cancer. The dirty little secret about this is that this underestimates how bad the problem was. I'm gonna tell you about the ESODATA database in a little bit of time. 40 centers, 6,000 resections over the last three years. 30 day mortality is 2.4% in this group. 30-day mortality underestimates the mortality associated with esophageal resection. And almost all of our reporting historically has been done on the, on the basis of 30-day mortality. 
Centralization for esophageal surgical services and high-risk oncologic care has gone on throughout the world except in the United States. This is a publication we did in Annals of Surgery in 2014 that compared a centralized system of delivery in the UK to a non-centralized system in the United States. I would love to tell you all about this study, but I'm going to point out one thing to you. When we looked at the 775 hospitals that we studied in the national inpatient sample in the United States, the median number of esophageal resections done at those 775 hospitals was two. And that was as recent as 2014. So in a system like this, you cannot get an infrastructure to deliver high quality oncologic care. And we used to think that the aspect of outcome was inexorably associated with how many resections you were doing. In fact, volume is a surrogate for establishing programs that can make us more successful with respect to surgical delivery. And standardized pathways, fast tra track, and more recently, ERAS programs are clearly infrastructure that will allow us to improve surgical care. We have had a standardized uh, clinical pathway for esophageal cancer management surgically at my institution since 1995. This is a publication in 2014 that highlighted the infrastructure that we have set up to control and to regulate every aspect of how we deliver care in the perioperative pathway. That's an important issue, and it's one of the reasons why we've, we've had a degree of success. If you look across the bottom, however, you'll see critical measurable goals because the aspect of ERAS and the aspect of these pathways are only as good as your ability to audit how you're doing and to tweak what you're doing on the basis of your ability to deliver good care. If you look at the results from that publication in 2014 that involves 600 resections, I'm demonstrating here what we all know. We're being asked to operate on more complicated patients all the time. Age is going up, BMI is increasing, comorbidity indices is going up, and the complexity of presentation is all becoming more complex over time. If you utilize these infrastructural pathways and ERAS, you can, however, in spite of that, continue to deliver improved results. Over that same time period, and in spite of the increased complexity, operative blood loss goes down, fluid utilization goes down, utilization of the ICU decreases, hospital stay and mortality in this entire period stayed under 1%. ERAS is obviously the new player on the block. We now have ERAS programs for colorectal, bariatric, gynecologic, and in fact, gastrectomy. As of November of 2018, the ERAS Society uh, developed these under guidance of people who were already involved to produce ERAS guidelines for esophageal resection as well. I will tell you that that gives you an outstanding format under which to basis the process of your care for esophageal and gastric resections, but it can't be all you do. You need programs and pathways for your patients, for your trainees and fellows, because they rotate in and out, and ultimately, you need to have a situation in you, even, even, where surgical um, aspects of our partners in SIN anesthesia also have a standardized approach that they use for these highly complex operations. And these are the pathways developed in our institution to standardize the anesthetic care during esophageal resections. This also gives you an opportunity to tweak these pathways and to look into infrastructural gains that can make us better. Here are some examples, but one is the aspect that, especially in the open era, immediately perioperative pain control is a critically important in situation. In open operations, we've historically used epidurals, and like us, our anesthesiologists are not perfect, and there is a failure rate with the aspect of how, how well an epidural will work. We introduced a program of epidural grams. My hospital mandates an on-table chest and abdominal x-ray to look for foreign bodies. At the time of, this, uh, the time of these x-rays in flow, we'll do an epidural injection, which can demonstrate conclusively whether that epidural catheter is in the right spot, and we can move on. Just as importantly, in 30% of cases, it'll show it's not in the right spot. And we can immediately move to correct that, which will allow us to maintain the aspect of what are the issues within our pathway, which is important. Why are these improvements important to surgeons? Well, there are two trials, one in the Netherlands 
and one in France, the Sano and the Isa Strait trial, that are specifically looking to develop an aspect of identifying complete clinical responses to make surgery discretionary rather than as a routine aspect of how we deliver care in esophageal cancer. So we have to continue to aspect of dealing with the issues regarding our perioperative outcomes, and we have to continue to improve them. Reg Bell tells me that the Foregut Society is thinking of establishing a data set. He's asked me to introduce you to, the, to uh, an easedata.org data set that we um, established several years ago. It was the first international example of prospective web-based oncologic data collection, and it was initiated by a group of initially 11 surgeons in Newcastle in 2011 to establish a standard criteria for identifying complications associated with esophageal resection to develop quality measures and specific definitions for complications. It led to a standardized aspect of how we report complications and quality measures, which we published in Annals of Surgery in 2015. And in 2016, we established the isodata.org data set, which is on the cloud. This initially involved 21 centers that were routinely putting their data not onto institutional data sets, but straight through their computers into a data set that was on the internet. Initially, the advantages of this particular situation was there was no software installation required in individual centers. There was no requirement for local IT support or loading lag time. There was no need for software updates or institutional maintenance. And up to and including the present day, there is no cost to the institution for participation. The give back is that <clears throat> Blair Job, who's been part of our group since the beginning, can go on his smartphone and if he had some data managers that put on some cases in his institution yesterday, he can look through the data from his institution on his smartphone at any time. And this is really an example of how these new on the cloud data sets can make us more efficient with respect to international research. We beta tested the complications platform on ESA data starting in 2016 and published this in Annals of Surgery, which came out just last year. And I'm pleased to say that the platform that we've developed for complications has been accepted by four national data sets. And this is the first publication from a national data set using the ECC jet platform, just came out in Annals of Surgery, and this is, from, um, this is from Holland. When you have a standardized platform for complications and you're actually collecting everything that's going on, the instance of complications are very high. But when you utilize the standard definition for identifying the severity, you could also know that even though the leak rate is 8%, we're only operating on 25% of those as, th as time goes along. These are the original 21 members that uh, contributed to ESA data. As of today, there are 41 international members routinely putting data in into ESA data on the cloud. If you look at the aspect of the power of this, and remember that leapfrog data currently defines high volume esophagectomy practice as 13 resections per year. Since January of 2017, we've collected 6,600 contemporary esophageal resections over a very short period of time, which gives us a power for contemporary analysis that no one's ever had before. As a template for the Foregut Society, this ESA data data set is being overseen by a committee under the International Society for Diseases of the Esophagus. There's three subcommittees that involve uh, the aspect of membership, publications, and new research, which all involve the aspects of the contributors. Next step for the database is we are now going to take over responsibility for collecting data for the next AJCC9 iteration for esophageal cancer, and for the very first time, we're going to start to collect gen genetic and biologic data on esophageal cancer. With respect to survival, there'd be no presentation that, that, that could avoid talking about the potential for increasing our understanding of where targeted therapy is going to fit in. There are a myriad of questions that we should be asking at this point. As I've already said from the European trials, can we watch and wait for a clinical complete response? What do we do when people present with clinical advanced nodal disease? What do we do post-trimodality therapy when we have positive nodes, positive margins, and poor regression grade? And on top of that, how should we be treating T2 N0 esophageal cancer? But maybe most importantly, has immune or targeted therapy a role in neoadjuvant therapy? 
I've told you that we're going to start to collect uh, biologic and genetic data for the first time, p53 mutations, microsatellite instability, immunoscore, PD-L1, and Epstein-Barr virus are going to be routinely collected as an aspect of monitoring the outcome in esophageal cancer. We already know that there are certain genetic profiles that will dictate the outcome in esophageal cancer treatment with respect to evidence-based therapy. We also have the advantage of our pharmacological colleagues have developed an increasing array of medications to treat these particular targeted therapies. And there are multiple ongoing phase three trials in gastrointestinal cancer looking at where these particular agents are going to fit in long term. We can take example from our breast uh, cancer colleagues in that gene profiling is now a natural association or a natural, uh, uh, a natural component of what they do in breast cancer treatment. And I'm going to show you this publication because it's from New England Journal, and you're going to ask yourself, how can a pilot study involving 21 patients get into the New England Journal? Well, it's because these were surgical patients with non-small cell lung cancer who had two doses of a PD-1 blockade before they went to surgery. And what the finding in these 21 patients was <clears throat> that 50% of patients had over 90% tumor regression at the time of surgery. So there is an example of where targeted therapy is ultimately going to make huge inroads. I'd love to tell you all about the Elixir trial, but I can't. But I am going to tell you what we can start to think of as a national assembly in the aspect of how we should be doing research. The Elixir trial is in the UK. It's looking at evidence-based precision therapy for esophageal gastric cancer. What it does is it takes every esophageal and EG junction cancer in the UK, which is presented at a multidisciplinary tumor board, which is 100% of cases, and it sends biologic information to the central genomic multidisciplinary tumor board in Cambridge and Southampton. Genetic profiling is done on every one of those tumors, and then they are allocated into specific management according to their genetic profiling. And there are now trials being developed in the UK involving neoadjuvant, adjuvant, relapse therapy, and advanced disease that will make sure that every patient in the UK is targeted for, a, an, a, for an assessment on the basis of targeted therapy in the future. And this is going to be a game-changing study. I hope my initial comments have demonstrated to you how complex evidence-based care is becoming for regional esophageal cancer. I'm going to take a second to show you this publication from 2018. And I'm going to highlight something that surgeons once again should be aware of. This was from the National Cancer Database. They looked at five years of therapy. And despite widespread acceptance and knowledge that achieving an R0 resection results in the best long-term survival after neoadjuvant therapy, this, this examination of the National Cancer Database demonstrated that only 55% of the study population is still <clears throat> undergoing surgery after receiving their chemo radiation. That means they're not receiving surgery even though they could. The reason for this was three quarters of that group, it was because it was never discussed in association with their initial review of their treatment options, which means they weren't presented at a tumor board. And what it also demonstrates is that the aspect of applying evidence-based therapy is not happening in the United States. And in fact, less than 20% of the patients that we have with esophageal gastric cancer are presented at a multidisciplinary tumor board. We reviewed the importance of multidisciplinary review at our institution several years ago. We looked at esophageal and lung cancer. We asked the managing physician to provide his current plan, and then we reviewed it at tumor board, and we found that 21% of esophageal cancer patients had changes after a tumor board review, and 12, 11% of these changes were major changes in treatment planning. In case you think that was very innovative, quite frankly, it's been done multiple times before, indicating that the best evidence-based care always takes place after multidisciplinary review. Back to these things, what's most important? They're all important. Developing an aspect of a cost-effective screening program is going to allow us to improve survivorship, but targeted therapy is going to change the face of the treatment of regional esophageal cancer for everyone in this room within the aspects of our practice lifetime. Thank you very much.